Chair Jack uh, Deliso, uh, Professor Andrew Nassen, uh, Dr. Bonin Lind, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to TECO. I would like to begin by thanking you all for attending uh, this symposium. Uh, my heartfelt thanks uh, go to FPI uh, for co-hosting this timely event and to the distinguished panelists who are going to share with us their insights. In the global election of 2024, Taiwan has scored the first victory for democracy and the implication of which go beyond the island itself. <coughs> The successful completion of another free and fair election not only validate Taiwan's vibrant democracy, but as a testament to Taiwan's commitment to standing in solidarity with our democratic partners. Since 1996, uh, Taiwan has conducted eight rounds of presidential election with three peaceful changes of power between governing parties. And on January 13, uh, Taiwanese voters elect Dr. Lai ching De as the 16th uh, president and Ms. Bi Kim Sha as the vice president of the Republic of China, Taiwan. On the same day, voters also decided who will fill the 113 seats in the legislative yuan. <coughs> Though the KMT own uh, the most seats, but no parties uh, own the uh, outright majority in legislature. In this election, roughly 40 million voters cast vote. Uh, with a turnout rate of uh, 71%. Though facing military intimidation, economic coercion, and disinformation campaign, Taiwanese voters have shown resilience in withstanding the assault on democracy. They sent a clear message to the world that Taiwan's future is a decision reserved solely for its own citizen. On the front line of authoritarian expansion, Taiwan's experience in countering election interference has valuable lessons for other democracies and will be a contribution to the rule-based international order. Looking ahead, Taiwan will keep engaging with a democratic partner in the world. There is a consensus across the major parties that support furthering bilateral relationship with our diplomatic alliance and democratic partners. As the U.S.-Taiwan partnership continues to thrive on its rock-solid foundation, Taiwan will remain a trustworthy partner working closely with like-minded countries to uphold regional security and prosperity. Peace and stability across Taiwan Strait is an indispensable element to the security and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. President-elect Lai ching De has made it clear that he will seek a balanced approach to cross-strait relations and remain committed to maintaining the status quo while open to dialogues with China. We believe that ensuring peace is in everyone's best interest. Again, thank you all for joining us here tonight. And we are honored to have a panel of experts uh, who have long witnessed the development of Taiwan democracy. And I hope you will benefit from their insightful observation. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Dean. Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Chair Jacques Delisle, the moderator and speaker tonight. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to Director Lee and to Tico for hosting uh, this event. It's uh, great to be here on behalf of the Foreign Policy Research Institute and its uh, Asia program. Um, terrific uh, colleagues on the panel here. I'll just give them the briefest of introductions so we can turn to our substantive program here. To my left is Andrew Nathan, the class of 1919 professor of political science at Columbia University. He's also been the department chair and the director of the Weatherhead East Asia Institute and the chairman or board member of Human Rights in China, Freedom House, Human Rights Watch Asia, and has written uh, extremely widely, as probably everyone knows, on uh, Chinese politics, China's foreign policy, and on Taiwan issues and human rights issues as well. Uh, to my right is Bonnie Lin. Uh, she is the Senior Fellow for Asian Security and Director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Before that, she was the Associate Director of Strategy and Doctrine Program at the RAND Corporation, uh, and she uh, was in the Office of Secretary of Defense Office uh, working on Taiwan and China issues. Uh, both of them have uh, consulted often with the U.S. government, uh, and then Bonnie, uh, like Andy, has written a lot on these issues, so it's uh, great to have them here with me. I'm Jacques Delisle, Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and the Chair of the Asian Program at FPRI. So I think what we're gonna do here is, is start with a little recap of what happened, uh, and then look at the, the implications of the elections in Taiwan. So first, focusing a little bit on the near term, and then looking a little farther over uh, the horizon. So I'm just going to give a few statistics, a few bit, bits of information that's probably known to everyone, but we'll do it as a bit of a, um, uh, a stage setting. First of all, um, Taiwan's elections are an amazing study in democracy. I mean, 70% plus, plus turnout uh, is something that uh, we don't often see here. Uh, and it is about as transparent an electoral process as you get. If you've ever been to elections in Taiwan, there are uh, thousands of polling places in uh, elementary schools, the community centers, temples, uh, and uh, everyone comes in and it's a paper ballot and when the ballot ends, uh, they count the ballots right in front of you. They hold one, one person holds it up and another person says what the ballot is for and a third person marks it on the, um, on the tally. Uh, if I were a school teacher in Taiwan, I'd be very tired writing the character Chung. Uh, <laughs> by the end of the election season, that's sort of the equivalent of the four with the cross-strike uh, cross hashtags here. Uh, and so what happened this time is Taiwanese voters went to the polls and they cast three ballots, most of them. Uh, one for the president, which is a three-way race in which Lai Ching-de, the incumbent vice president uh, of the Democratic Progressive Party, won with 40% of the vote, a uh, minority share, it's the second time that's happened in Taiwan's democratic era. Uh, in, as in the prior time in 2000, it's a, a true three-way race, three candidates that, that scored pretty well. Uh, the Kuomintang and the KMT finished in second, OUE. Their candidate was about a third of the vote, a bit more. And the upstart Taiwan People's Party, by the way, I've got to complain that TPP and DPP sound too much like one another, uh, but, but we'll try to keep them separate. Uh, but Koenja, the former mayor of Taipei, uh, who established this new Taiwan People's Party, uh, did a quite uh, impressive just over one quarter of the vote. In, and then in the legislature, there are two uh, ballots that people cast. One is a single member district, basically very much on the American model there. Although there are a couple, there, there are six representatives from Aboriginal districts that are uh, multi-member constituencies, but that's only six, six seats. And then the remaining uh, seats are done by, the minority of the seats are done by proportional representation, a, a party slate uh, vote where the parties rank their candidates and however many uh, they get, you go that deep into the list. And so we saw uh, this time, as, as uh, Ambassador Lee mentioned, is we saw no one get a majority in the legislative yen. So the KMT uh, went up from 38 seats to 52 plus two non-party candidates who, uh, who basically uh, caucus with the KMT. The DPP lost its majority. It had 61 out of 113. It's now down to 51. And the TPP, the Kalinja Upstart Party, has eight seats and holds the balance. There are negotiations going on right now, uh, probably over by now, about who uh, the TPP, which holds the balance in the legislature, will back for the legislative speaker. Uh, the candidates are interesting ones. One is Yoshi Kun, who is the current legislative speaker from the DPP, um, the old veteran. Uh, and for the KMT, it's Han Yu, the presidential candidate who lost quite badly uh, to Tsai Ing-wen in 2016, I would say there. Neither one of them is somebody one would think of as exactly at the middle of the political spectrum, which is where the TPP has tried to position itself. So it's going to be interesting to see which, which side they, they go with. So that's a quick recap of what happened. Um, let me turn to my colleagues here and see if they have any reflections on the election. And I'll, I'll loop back to some of the issues we're seeing. 
Well, thank you, Jack, and uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to uh, have this dialogue, but also hopefully hear from the group here about your views, too. Uh, I thought, in addition to what you highlighted, there were a couple of things that really stood out to me from the election. One is, as you mentioned, uh, the, the large number of votes the TPP was able to gain, I think much higher than we've seen any third party in quite some time. The other thing I would flag is that um, uh, in addition to uh, the, the votes, I think it's also important to note that this is the first time we've seen a party in Taiwan be able to win an election three times in a row, right? So I, I think right now, uh, as we look at uh, VP elect and his administration, there's all there's probably some thinking, well, some thinking within the administration about what does it mean to be um, a third term, to have a third term for a DPP candidate. Because typically we've seen uh, changes after two terms. Um, I think as we look at the election, particularly when I look at it from China's perspective, uh, I think it probably was what China expected for quite some time. We've seen the polling results showing over time that um, that uh, the the DPP was uh, VP line was always quite high, and leading up to the polls, um, we we saw the numbers quite similar to the actual result outcome. But from China's perspective, if you look at this, it's probably the uh, election that, um, the result is probably the outcome that China um, is probably least likely to act out on, mainly because even though uh, VP Lai won the election, uh, he did not win with the majority that um, uh, that's President Tsai did in 2020 or 20, 2016 and he did not control the House. So when we look at it from a, a perspective of a, um, a, a cross-strait uh, stability perspective, um, at least from China's perspective, when, it, when Beijing looks at the results, it should think that there is, that there is no reason to use force, um, that there is no reason why um, the results sh should indicate that, uh, provide any rationale for Beijing to to provoke or to escalate coercion against Taiwan. Yeah, just to underscore a little bit of that, um, that um, you know, three terms is, is unprecedented. I was in Beijing, I was in Taipei for the elections for the week leading up. The week before that, I was in Beijing talking to you know, people who do Taiwan policy, and my sense was they were resigned to it. They'd been reading the polls too. They weren't happy, uh, but there was a sense of this is what's going to happen, and a kind of, well, not great, but, you know, Three terms is one thing, four terms would be harder to take. Uh, but I think they, they sort of lock themselves into a policy which is eight years of not talking to Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP means four years of probably not talking to Lai ching and the DPP, although Lai in his victory speech and in his campaign emphasized that he was open uh, to and would encourage engagement and negotiations on a basis of equality, but you know, Beijing has not yet uh, waived the 92 consensus and the one China principle as preconditions. There's some talk that they might because it's a non-starter, uh, but it would have to be some acknowledgement uh, uh, that I think is a lot farther than Lai is, is willing uh, to go on that front. Andy? So, um, one point I would make is that B. Kim Xiao is a Columbia graduate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, she was my advisee when she was in the MA program. Never asked for any advice after that. Um, second thing is, I don't know the answer to this, but I would just put it on the table. What um, is the weakening of DPP support <coughs> about? And I think it might be partly about the economy. That's been an enduring issue of dissatisfaction among voters. And partly about uh, the doubts that people in Taiwan have about the uh, alliance, the, the re reliance upon the United States to protect Taiwan, which is a very understandable um, doubt. But um, that is the strategy. And people in Taiwan don't want a war, and they don't trust, a lot of people don't trust the United States. And the third thing I would say about Beijing is, my impression is that Beijing had given up hope on any of the candidates. So no matter who got elected, Beijing would, I, I'm not quite as uh, optimistic as it sounds like Ronnie is, because I think Beijing will ramp up pressure no matter which candidate was the winner, because 
all of those candidates are responsive to public opinion, which doesn't want to unify or to move toward unification or to uh, you know weaken Taiwan identity. So although they they all talked in ambiguous terms about well the two other candidates in particular, uh, but all the ambiguous terms about how they would somehow make things better and more stable and peaceful. But none of them, uh, but on Beijing's side, I think there's no market for any uh, replay of cooperation with, as they did with Li Dunhui at first, or with Ma Ying-jeou, that they think that uh, the idea that a party would come to power in Taiwan that would actually enter into political meaningful political negotiations or talks with Taipei, that that's over with, and their strategy has to be something else. I think that's right, and if you look at the uh, positions that all three candidates staked out as near-term cross-straits, there wasn't a lot of a lot of difference. Right? It's over the horizon issues and tonal issues and predictions about how Beijing will react. But yeah, you know, everybody says, yeah, I'm based on the status quo. And I think one of one of the possible explanations for the measured response from Beijing is partly, you know, recognition uh, that nobody's going to do what they want. Um, you know, Hou Yi was not in a position to go back even to the Mike Jill years, let alone more than that. Uh, and uh, you know, if you needed a demonstration about how today's KMT is not the KMT of Mike Jill or the KMT even of Hang Yi from the last cycle, it's that uh, you know Mike Jill went out there and gave his Deutsche Welle interview uh, just before the election and said, you know, we could uh, reunification. Sure, that's a possibility. And the next thing you see is the KMT candidates backpedaling furiously from that position. So I think baked into the Beijing calculus is yes, they can't get from Hou Yi what they would have hoped to have gotten from the KMT beforehand. And if that's where the KMT is headed, there's not a lot of uh, distance there on actual concrete uh, policies. But Bonnie, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, to add to Andrew's list of um, why uh, uh, VP Lai didn't do as well in the polls as uh, President Tsai, I think it's also maybe an issue of um, views of particularly among the population of the DPP as the establishment. Right, so some of the appeal of Ko and Zhe was to the youth, to those who both viewed both the KMT and the DPP as establishment parties. So Ko was able to pull away a good portion of the youth vote. I would also note, maybe I misspoke, I didn't mean to say that China would not coerce Taiwan. What I meant to say was, uh, if China was expecting the worst outcome from their perspective of uh, VP Lai winning, I think the results was, from their perspective, um, probably the least bad outcome. Because if there was a majority from, uh, from the PRC perspective, it may have provided more, um, more, um, more more impetus on their end to try to do more against Taiwan. But what we saw from the Taiwan Affairs Office, as well as what we saw from a Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was a, a view of the election as very much a contested one, and a view in which uh, uh, the victory of uh, VP Lai, which I, as we mentioned, still very much a, um, a well-won victory from the PRC perspective, did not represent the will of the majority of the Taiwan people. To get to uh, Andy's other point about uh, where you know, where the dissatisfaction came from, I mean, if you go to the Kulin to the rallies, you see a lot of young people. I mean, it was a really remarkably young crowd. Um, they didn't seem, in some cases, like they were there because of uh, really deep-seated, zealous support for Kulin Jilin, whatever he stood for, and he took a lot of positions over the course of the campaign. But I think the point's well taken that for the younger voters, they've lived with eight years of DPP rule, so the establishment is the DPP. I mean, even in 2016, you know, that was four years ago, a lot of people have sort of aged further through the system. And, and, and of course, 2016 had the shadow of Hong Kong, which motivated everyone to, to come out and vote uh, DPP. Uh, but a lot of young folks are just unhappy. As you say, you know, housing prices are high, young people can't uh, buy an apartment, and they're worried about older parents, and funding uh, health care is, is a problem. All these, these kind of quality of life and economic issues. And you, you can't sort of run away from that if you're the DPP, and I think they took a hit for that with especially young voters. Uh, and then there is the KMT problem, because as much as young voters have gotten alienated from the DPP, they, they really don't see the KMT as the place to go. Uh, and so you get, get people going to DPP. But, but you know, there's also a lot of older voters and people who are just dissatisfied with both parties for whatever reason. But one of the things we should probably talk about here is the near, near miss, maybe, on a unity ticket. So we had this three-way race, and 
uh, in the run-up to the election, there was an attempt, uh, led by Mike Gio of all people, uh, to try to get the Kalinja and the KMT tickets to align and run as a block. Uh, I think on the mistaken math, that if you add 33 plus 26, you wind up with a majority. I don't think it's nearly that neat a translation. But the thought was that they had a chance, at least, of, of cobbling together enough to be lying. Some of those people probably would have gone green, some of those people would have stayed home, but at least would have given them a fighting chance, and that unraveled. Why did it unravel? Any thoughts? Um, I guess I've heard different theories on why it unraveled. One was that each side went in with different expectations of, of what to get. I, I, my understanding is I don't think Cope would have walked in uh, into that meeting with three uh, KMT heavyweights if he didn't think that there was a possibility that he could end up at the top of the ticket. And when he came out and he did not end up at the top of the ticket, and there wasn't a clear um, a sense from that meeting, I think that may have set expectations in a different way. Um, but I think the fundamental factor was there was probably no agreement who would be at the top of the ticket. Um, and what was interesting, implication of this was, uh, after this four-way meeting, we really saw the effects of this meeting uh, impact Kuh more negatively than uh, his KMT competitor. Uh, we saw a number of his uh, supporters view him as less reliable, as potentially flip-flopping, but we didn't see too much of a negative impact on Ho. In fact, as Ho went on to pick his VP candidate, we saw Ho actually consolidating his support among the KMT base. Right, and so uh, to get back to Andy's former student, uh, the vice presidential picks were kind of interesting here. I mean, the, the, the Ho Yui went to the deep blue side, so where Zhao Shaokang was his vice president, who actually was associated with the new party, which was the kind of most pro-China end of the spectrum. So it really was, as a Taiwanese KMT candidate, Ho had to shore up that side. Uh, becomes an interesting choice. I mean, on the one hand, got solid deep green credentials, but um, you know she knows how to talk the talk and walk the walk in a way that maybe Lai didn't. So you know, you've looked a lot at U.S.-Taiwan and U.S.-Taiwan-China relations. What do you see happening going forward on that front, and particularly the role of BKM? There's been some speculation that she is essentially going to be entrusted with a very large part of the U.S. portfolio because that's what she does. And she also helped domestically with you know, energizing young voters and such. But this was thought as potentially a reassuring move to Washington and maybe a portfolio uh, allocation to her to, to handle this particular group of barbarians. Yeah, I don't know about uh, the division of labor going forward, but I think everybody here knows that she was incredibly successful as the representative in Washington, and she had, because she's very um, honest and plain talking, as well as careful in the way that she talks, and she got a lot of, my understanding is a great deal of trust among all the different forces in Washington. And Lai, of course, <clears throat> had made this remark about being uh, what was it? What was the a idea? worker for Taiwan independence or a pragmatic worker for Taiwan right. independence. We take the slightly amended version. Pragmatic worker for Taiwan independence. And so there was concern in Washington, and I suppose potentially there, you know, will, will remain concern going forward about his self discipline. I mean, he has. Laid down the position that he's going to continue the Taiwan policy of status quo, but then there's this even, you know, even I mean, in our government as well, we have this question of discipline. Biden go wandering off the correct line by saying that, uh, yeah, we have to, we, we're committed to defending Taiwan, which is true, but you're not supposed to say so. <laughs> and uh, and of course, uh, uh, Lai Chinda's uh, experience as a politician is not that long. I mean, he's been the VP, but um, so the concern in Washington. So I think the selection of Bikim at least is reassuring in Washington, but then going forward, as I say, I'm not sure what the division of labor would be, but I do think that if there's a need to communicate to Washington with credibility, so she might do that on a regular basis as a portfolio, or she might do it when necessary, but this is a function. I think she's just about uniquely qualified to perform because of the uh, unusual level of trust. And she's went to undergrad Oberlin, and she's very, um, you know, American. She's very, very comfortable in American culture as well as in Taiwan culture. So I, I would. I think that's an important function.
functions. So this gets us in a bit to what the U.S.-Taiwan relationship will look like uh, going forward. So uh, Andy made mention of the uh, Biden statements, which uh, China sees as at least pushing the envelope on strategic ambiguity. Right? We will defend Taiwan at least in the event of an unprovoked attack, <coughs> which is you know, perfectly consistent with strategic ambiguity, but it's kind of hitting one side of it. Um, we've always been, I think, relatively clear that under some circumstances the U.S. will ride to the rescue. And as you alluded to earlier, there is this doubt about whether the U.S. guarantee is reliable. Um, uh, Mang Jiu and Su Qi, uh, long associate with Ma, have been among the most prominent people in Taiwan being skeptical about that. Um, so you know, how do we navigate this? What, is the U.S. doing the right thing to offer the requisite level of assurance to Taiwan? And what are the risks in terms of uh, feeding the concern in Beijing that the U.S. is essentially hollowing out uh, strategic ambiguity, hollowing out its one China policy, which is of course different from Beijing's one China principle. How, what's it look like for D.C.? What are these discussions uh, sound sure. like? There? So I don't see um, any discussion in D.C. that we should be changing our Taiwan policy. I think, as you all know, there is bipartisan, very strong support for Taiwan, as well as bipartisan view on uh, um, centering around the competition uh, with China as well as how much of a challenge and threat China poses to the United States. So I don't see, um, I think regardless of who, who would have won Taiwan's elections, I don't see that DC's policy towards Taiwan would have changed. Now as we were discussing when it comes to our policy for Taiwan um, and the uh, election of VP Lai as well as um, uh, Ambassador Xiao, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of confidence in both of them. Um, I think as we've been looking at, we, obviously there's very careful attention paid to what uh, both have said or done since the election, but also during the campaign. And um, I think there was one incident during the campaign that caused um, some uh, concern within DC, but I think that was quickly um, addressed and dealt with. And I think moving forward, um, both sides are likely to keep very much in, in uh, close coordination when it comes to any statements um, or any um, public uh, statements, both on the U.S. side, but also if VP Lai wants to make any public statements or, uh, or, um, or appearances before the inauguration. And of course, we are looking to see what would happen after the inauguration. Our basic principle, my understanding, is that right now that Taiwan has one president at a time. Right now, it's still President Tsai Ing-wen, and it will not be until May 20th it, it, where we will probably see um, a VP Lai really step up and be able to shape Taiwan politics. So, um, the correct American policy on Taiwan that would uh, maintain, th that would be the historic policy is very subtle. And it's difficult for officials in Washington to always get it right because they have, you know, they're very tired and they have a lot of things to deal with and they're not experts in this one issue. So, um, so the, as I understand it, the, the, so if, if one believes that the American policy should not change, that's gonna be a policy that says we would accept any outcome that's peacefully arrived at and we don't have any opinion. And that's the, the declaratory policy, but it is, in fact, not true. The truth is that the United States doesn't want Taiwan to be unified with China, and the reasons for that are partly value reasons, democracy, anti-communism, anti authoritarianism, but I think majorly there are strategic reasons, partly about the computer chips, but mainly, so I'm going to say it's like 15 or 10 percent values diplomacy and it's 25 percent computer chips and what's the rem <coughs> remainder, you know, and so, and the rest of it is the first island chain and that China has this gigantic navy that cannot freely come and go. And once um, I, I like to sort of exaggerate and say that once China controls Taiwan and can freely come and go bet between the two sides of Taiwan into the Philippine Sea, it is in San Diego. There's nothing between the Philippine Sea and San Diego, really, except a lot of water. So uh, the United States would rather uh, bottle up 
the Chinese Navy, which is very big and could be roaming the, you know, does roam the seas of the world, but not with the same freedom that it would have if it controlled Taiwan. But you're not allowed to say these things. So there are people in Washington, famously Eli Ratner, who was, I forget what position he's in in the Defense Department, who said Taiwan is of strategic importance to the United States. True, but don't say that. Um, and there are uh, people, so when, when Bonnie says she's not hearing anybody advocate for changes because of her um, preference to uh, talk to people who are sensible and reasonable. <laughs> but, so, but, it, but there are also people, uh, well, as you all know, there was a serious think tank advocacy for something called strategic clarity. There, there are people who, have, uh, Mike Pompeo has advocated, I don't know about recently, but has advocated for a, signing a defense treaty with Taiwan. Trump comes in, one doesn't know what he might be inspired to do on, you know, Wednesday that he wasn't thinking about on Tuesday and so on. So, um, and, and the anti-China, um, the value in the Congress of bashing China, the political value, it's all gain and no loss to bash China. And uh, when you're bashing China, then you start to think, what can I advocate that would, you know, that would hurt the Chinese? And Taiwan comes in as a rhetorical chess piece in these, uh, these discourses. So I think if the Biden administration stays in power and sort of Kurt Campbell can keep control over everybody, including Biden, um, so that nobody says anything except the standard thing, that'll be good. But but it's hard to keep everybody in line. The U.S. government is very big. And a lot of people uh, say things. Um, so I know that, uh, well, but that's enough for this. <laughs> can, I, can I jump in here? So I, 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 there are, of course, voices within D.C. advocating for various ways to change U.S. policy towards Taiwan. But I guess what, what I was saying is I'm not hearing any voices within the Biden administration saying that there should be any change in U.S. policy towards Taiwan. Um, and maybe in defense of Assistant Secretary of Defense Eli Ratner, who also used to work at the RAND Corporation, where I used to work, I think his remarks have been taken out of context. I don't think he was trying to set U.S. policy or change U.S. policy. I think he was, as you were suggesting, just um, pointing out the absolute strategic importance and value of Taiwan based off of its geopolitical lo location. Well, I, I can do that, but he should not. <laughs> I would also add perhaps to your list of why Taiwan is important and probably why we are here, probably the number one of the number one reasons is Taiwan is a value, is a democracy, right? And if you look at, um, for at least um, both within the Biden administration, but also I would say broadly among even Republicans, there is strong value in supporting other democracies. And in many ways, uh, a democratic ta Taiwan provides a foil for China because it shows the Chinese people that even if um, uh, he, he, it shows the Chinese people that it is possible to have a democracy given Chinese culture, and the system within that we're currently seeing in China is not the only system that can can be possible. So it, I think there is significant value in maintaining not only democracy within Taiwan uh, for itself, but also when we think about our competition with China, having a democracy in Taiwan is absolutely critical to show Taiwan there is an alternative. Sorry, to show China that there is an alternative political system. So if we take as something of a given um, that the U.S. goal is to offer a significant degree of support to Taiwan, and at the same time to avoid a crisis or a conflict in the Strait perfectly decent articulation of US strategy. I think, yes, the unspoken strategic value as well as the moral and economic value of Taiwan. That still leaves some of the hard questions on the table, which is what is the best policy set of mechanisms and tactics for getting there? 
Uh, and so calls for strategic clarity, I think, have been right. They, they come up like kudzu every every uh, several years, um, and they certainly have come up in the recent context. And I think you know they're 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 pretty easy arguments to beat back strategic clarity. Uh, the problem, of course, is if you make a list of when you will intervene and when you won't, then you run the risk of putting something inside the fence that you decide shouldn't be there. Now, what do you do if you don't do something you think doesn't serve either American or Taiwanese interests, but you can't back away from it? On the other hand, it's a rapidly changing situation. China's developing new tactics all the time, and if you leave something outside the fence, then China's going to say you've moved the goalposts. I think I just mis mixed metaphors there, but you know what I mean. Um, so strategic clarity, terrible idea, I think we can agree. But where, what do you do in, in, in between? As, as, as Andy says, the US government speaks with many voices, not just in the administration, but Congress. And there's a lot of legislation uh, that has come through. I mean, we lived with almost no significant Taiwan-related legislation from the TRA until about 2016. And then we get this raft of support for Taiwan's international space, for closer defense cooperation, uh, for pushing back against uh, states that switch diplomatic recognition and so on. You get more arms sales, closer cooperation, the Taiwan Travel Act for higher level visits and all that. And then you get things that some would describe as loving Taiwan too much, the Pelosi visit, uh, right, which was a, a high level uh, sign of support, but one that triggered some serious blowback. Uh, that, that sort of lower key side transit visit that she met with the uh, rather short lived uh, speaker, <laughs> Kevin McCarthy. He out outlasted his trust, but may outlast Johnson. Uh, but you know, how do you navigate this sort of situation? I mean, to, to, to put it a little differently, I think the U.S. goal has long been consistent with a form of dual deterrence: stop China from coercing Taiwan, stop Taiwan from doing the kinds of things that would provoke uh, a conflict, you know, formal uh, declaration of independence, and so on. But for the last 16 years, we haven't been too worried about deterring Taiwan. Uh, under Ma, and under Tsai, it's been pretty restrained. The U.S. view has been that the problems particularly post-2016, um, have been largely on China's side. But China keeps saying, well, you're only ever telling us to back off. You're never telling Taiwan to behave. Um, so how do, you, how do you adapt this rather stable US set of goals, which I agree are formally agnostic, but de facto clearly prefer the status quo or something close to it? How do you pursue those in a world where China is doing what it's doing, even if Taiwan stays on a course of relative uh, consistency? Easy question, I think. <laughs> What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? Well, one, one thing, obviously, is military. I mean, I think it's very important to continue to build up credible deterrence, which involves both military reform in Taiwan, and I don't have a right to speak about details about this, but to increase Taiwan's ability to survive an attack uh, there is a question of what is the most likely Chinese military strategy if they do something, but leaving that aside, and since one doesn't know, I think one has to build up the ability of, the military ability of Taiwan, more training, more appropriate weapons. These are not my ideas, these are ideas I've borrowed from people who know more about it, but also the, the U.S. military posture itself is very vulnerable. Uh, and uh, I've, I've seen a lot of qualified people talk about that, the, the uh, uh, concentration of forces in aircraft carriers and in a few large bases that are vulnerable to Chinese missiles and other forms of attack uh, has to be corrected. And that's a very lengthy process, more dispersed, more agile. These are this terminology that's used in the defense community of uh, platforms so that it's harder for the Chinese to, you know, Killed 7,000 sailors with one uh, missile. So I think we're not in a very, um, uh, and it's a it's a moving game. I mean, you have to keep on keeping up with the Chinese changing strategy. So, but I think we're at the current time not in a good position. But fortunately, Xi Jinping's military is corrupt. He's purging people. Uh, I don't think he has confidence in them. So he's not in a, even though we're in a sort of weak posture at the moment. He also can't really take advantage of that at the present time. But we need to strengthen the, the military deterrence um, uh, and avoid, well, you know, avoid both us and people in Taiwan from doing things that would sort of force Xi Jinping's back against the wall so that he has to take stronger action. But I think 
the Pelosi example, there are a couple of, I would, I, there are two lessons I think from that. One is that the Chinese do not believe that the separation of powers is a real thing and that the head of Pelosi's political party, the head of the Democratic Party being Biden, wasn't able to stop her from doing it. They don't believe that. I can hardly believe it myself. Uh, so, uh, so, so that makes us very vulnerable to things that might happen in the Congress, where the Congress people have, often have calculations that are not the same as the ones we're talking about. They're not the executive. They're not managing all of foreign policy. They're running for re-election all the time. Um, that's one lesson. The other lesson is that after Pelosi, the Chinese didn't just temporarily put pressure on Taiwan. They changed the status quo permanently. The post-Pelosi situation of flights across the midline and all the things that the Chinese did at that time are now the status quo. So it doesn't go back, it's a ratchet system, and I think that they will continue to ratchet, I don't know exactly in what way, but continue the, sort of what they did in the South China Sea of changing the status quo. So as China built and militarized these islands in the South China Sea, everybody complained about it, but did nothing, and now they're there, and they are militarized, and at the time that they were doing it, I had military friends who said, well, those don't matter because on day one we'll just bomb the, uh, the sand islands and they'll be finished. But um, they do matter because at this moment they're allowing China to dominate the South China Sea, intimidate the Philippines, and, and, uh, and the same thing around the Senkakus, the status quo has changed and uh, nobody has been able to push back mm -hmm. against it. So I think that, let's say strategic culture would be seen to be working around Taiwan is that you keep, you know, some people call it salami tactic, just keep moving. It's like a ground game in football, you know, just keep, you know, upping the pressure, not with an idea of launching an attack or a blockade or something like this, but with an idea of sending a message uh, both to the Taiwanese and perhaps especially to the uh, officials in Washington, uh, the message would be, so now here we are, we're you know, bogged down in Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, um, uh, and we, we have this populist movement inside the United States and stuff like that, and then if you really present a serious possibility to an American president, that, and plus all that, we also want you to engage in a major war with the number two world power that has a navy bigger than yours, and which mostly is around that region and not you know, everywhere in the world. I think the Chinese are thinking that sooner or later, even though the Americans are very stupid, they will wake up. And that would be the moment when, you know, as Sun Tzu said, you can win without fighting. Um, so I think Jackie asked a very difficult question, and it goes to the core of why making uh, U.S. policy towards Taiwan so difficult. We don't actually have a stable status quo in the Taiwan Strait. If you look at Taiwan from the uh, U.S. perspective or Taiwan perspective, you see a picture of a China that, as Andrew has mentioned, is becoming more, much more coercive over time. If you, if you look at the power gap, uh, gap in capabilities, whether that's military, political, or economic capabilities between China and Taiwan now, and you look at where that power dynamic was 20 years ago, I think it's fair to say that the power gap has increased over time. So just to maintain and be able to defend Taiwan at the most baseline level, we need to, the United States needs to do more. Right? We need to do more than we've done five years ago. We need to do more than we've done 10 years ago because China is becoming more powerful uh, both vis-a-vis both vis -vis Taiwan, but also uh, compared to its neighbors, and also because China is becoming much more coercive. If you look at Chinese military operations uh, close to Taiwan, right, we did not really see China uh, engaging in regular activity that crosses the Taiwan Strait center line until um, under President Tsai Ing-wen. 
right? We didn't see that under our President Ma ying We didn't see that in much earlier periods. So there is a level of coercion that, if you look at raw data, it's undisputable. But then the problem is, if the United States does more with Taiwan to help maintain and reverse this, um, this growing power imbalance from the Chinese perspective, that's us changing our Taiwan policy. It's us doing more to support Taiwan. Because from the Chinese perspective, they define the status quo as Taiwan is part of China. So anything that we are doing or Taiwan is doing is revising that status quo. So, so part of what any U.S. administration has to do is how much more can we do with Taiwan without triggering a major reaction or negative response from China that could actually jeopardize and damage and reverse what we're trying to do in terms of building up more security for Taiwan. And I think that is a judgment that every administration must make on its own. And I, what I, my, my understanding is um, I think those probably in Congress and um, maybe those on the Republican side believe that we can do more. Um, I think that's why they're arguing for strategic clarity. They're, they're arguing that if we are more committed to Taiwan, it would actually cause China to back down. So it's a different assessment of how China may respond. I think uh, those in the Biden administration and perhaps um, some of the other folks may assess that if we actually do significantly more, it's more likely to trigger a major Chinese reaction. But I think what the underlying difficulty of calculating this is the recognition that the situation has become more difficult for, to, for Taiwan. And how do we balance helping Taiwan without causing doing something that could make it more harmful for Taiwan, either short term or longer term? And I agree with both of my colleagues here. I, <coughs> since we're in New York, I try to make a reference to Yogi Berra. Uh, he did not say, but he should have said, everybody loves the status quo. The problem is it keeps changing. Uh, and, there, and that, I think, is the dynamic we're in, right? I mean, as Bonnie says, China really is of the view that the problem is Taiwan will get away. All right? uh, and if you look at things like the anti-secession law, uh, it's you know, quite coercive in the sense that it explicitly reserves the right to use force to achieve unification. But it's also quite conservative in the sense that it says it's already ours, we just need not to let it get away. And much of the recent Chinese gripe about U.S. policy is the U.S. is hollowing out strategic ambiguity and hollowing out the one China policy by leaning entirely to the Taiwan side. So, you know, China says, you guys are trying to change the status quo. And in the U.S. view, of course, and the Taiwanese view to a significant degree, is China is changing the status quo. As Andy points out, that every time there's a gray zone uptick, it tends not to go back down. Um, and, you know, that, that is that dynamic, and you know, from the Taiwanese perspective, every Taiwanese president in recent years has said in one form or another, Taiwan is an independent uh, sovereign country which goes by the name ROC. Uh, you know, so there's, anything that changes that is problematic. So I think, I think we really are stuck in this, in this uh, uh, low trust coupled with partly posturing, partly genuine different perceptions uh, of what's going on. Um, all right, so one uh, say something please. about that. Um, so, another way of saying what I think Bonnie is saying is that um, if, if you agree with me that Xi Jinping doesn't want to uh, use military force and would prefer to win without using military force, then um, there's a huge difference between us doing things that, that are pragmatically useful and saying things, because if you do it and don't talk about it, Xi Jinping doesn't lose face, is not embarrassed, is not forced to draw the logical consequences. So this is the rationale for, um, to answer Jacques' question about what do we do, is to uh, you know, speak softly and, and prepare, a, you know, and, and have, have a credible, and we, and we we would believe. I think it's reasonable to believe that the Chinese side has good. Here are two assumptions I make that I think are reasonable. One is that the Chinese side has good information on what the United States' armaments are selling to Taiwan, what Taiwan training is doing, what deployments the United States is doing. They know their intelligence people know these things, so they get that message. We don't have to talk about it. And then the question is, does Xi Jinping get that message? And I have, you know, my guess is that he does get it. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, it can be contested because in these types of political systems, sometimes uh, such as, uh, such I want to say, such as in the Republican Party in the United States, 
the, the leader doesn't get the information, but I think Xi Jinping gets. So if he gets the information and he knows that the Americans and the Taiwanese are improving their deterrent posture but are not talking about it, then that's a good policy for us. But it's hard in our political system to make people not talk about things. Um, uh, a few federal judges have tried to do that. <laughs> So um, one of the things that, that uh, sort of loomed in the background here is, is what Beijing will try next, right? So we've had a relatively measured and restrained reaction to the election, clearly not happy about it, but pretty boilerplate statements and even a sort of glimmer of hope in stressing that Lai is a minority president, so most Taiwanese appear not to be as awful as DPP supporters in the, in the official view of China. Um, but you know, I think it's fair to say Taiwan has pursued a relatively consistent set of tactics to enhance or preserve its security in international space over, over a number of years, and they change from president to president, circumstance to circumstance. But basically, it's tried to maintain diplomatic relations with as many states as possible, although that's been a dwindling number. We're now down to an even dozen, uh, with Nauru being the latest, um, and concerns about a couple of others uh, on the horizon, perhaps. Um, then robust informal relations with the US and others, which have been quite strong. Uh, and then a quest for international space, right? So we saw the high point being uh, sort of ad hoc uh, participation in the WHA for several years during the Mai Zhou presidency. Uh, and that's now gone away, and we're seeing squeezing at the UN. China has pushed the res resolution 2758 as, in its view, establishing the Chinese version of the One China Principle, and Taiwan and its allies have pushed back, but you know, with limited effect, Gutierrez just you know, did one of the more uh, prominent public statements of a One China uh, uh, policy or principle of the UN built into 2758, so it's squeezing there. And you know, Taiwan has also then just tried to behave as a good international citizen. Right? It's, it, it acts as if it's a member of all these conventions that it's not allowed to join the human rights conventions and so on. Um, is that strategy still going to work? I mean, what kind of stresses does it face as China ratchets up pressure, as the US maybe is less zealously supporting some of these international norms, especially if we get a Trump election. Um, so what, what's the path forward for, for Taiwan? Does that kind of approach uh, still work uh, if China tries to poach a few more diplomatic allies, if we see even more assertive behavior in the UN and other international organizations? I, mean, I think that's a difficult question, perhaps more suited for Ambassador Lee and others. But I, but I think, um, uh, the path that Taiwan is currently on is probably the best path that Taiwan can take, mainly because um, I think if Taiwan were to be much more assertive uh, internationally or to try to do much more on the military front in terms of pushing China back from its course of military activities, those will trigger negative responses from China. Right? Like, I think the reason why Taiwan is on, a current, on its current path is because it's a very calculated and in many ways calibrated approach to try to protect what Taiwan currently has without aggravating China. I think if Taiwan were to change a path, uh, first of all, given the Chinese assumptions of, um, of the uh, Vice President William Lai, uh, President Lai, Lai, there will be, regardless of what Taiwan does, I worry the Chinese will go in assuming that what Lai is doing, even if he tries to take a different approach that could be viewed uh, from an unbiased perspective as not antagonistic to China, it could be viewed from the Beijing's end as pro-independence. That's just the, the assumption that China has when they when they will look at anything that um, a vice president line might do. I would also note that um, when it comes to what we can do more in terms of um, helping Taiwan in the, uh, the next four years, my major worry is that as China looks at the election results, um, how much of a support, how much uh, popular vote uh, BP Lai won, and how much of the legislative UN that DPP does not control. My worry is that China's going in goal will be to make sure that BP Lai is a one term president. And they will try to do that not by necessarily um, creating, uh, ne not necessarily relying mainly on military means, but potentially using uh, political, economic, and other means to destabilize the Lai government to make sure that it can't function or to make sure that it's perceived by the Taiwan people as not, um, either not credible or not being able to deliver. Just earlier today, or maybe it was yesterday, but I can't really tell based on the time difference, we already saw uh, China take another course of measure against Taiwan, right? We saw China, uh, the Taiwan Affairs Office announced at a prior um, 
uh, flight route that was um, still to the west of the Taiwan center line. The M503 flight route has now shifted a bit to closer to the center line. In addition to that flight route, there are now two additional flight routes, the M122 and the M123, that are now allowing um, China to fly airplanes, civilian airplanes, um, closer to, to connect to this M503 that would bring those airplanes closer to Taiwan's offshore islands, Kimanamatsu. Right, so we're already seeing China escalate in ways that are non-military means, and I think China recognizes its mili large-scale military activities that attract the most U.S. attention and probably allows Ch Taiwan to get the most buy-in to push back against China. So if they were to shift an approach, um, one way they could think about embracing more is using non-military action to pressure Taiwan. I, I don't think that the uh loss of formal diplomatic partners is that consequential, except symbolically. And Taiwan has, I don't know the number now, but 100 and how many representative offices around the world that are not embassies and consulates. And so I think they are able to do practical business, and that's more important. Of course, there's a, as I say, symbolic significance to breaking up relations and you uh, so, but I think, uh, aside, besides what Bonnie has said, the economic aspect, there's a lot of room for the mainland to put more and more pressure on Taiwan economically. So I, my understanding is they announced they wouldn't re, uh, re what is the word, the ECFA, you know, they wouldn't continue the ECFA trade agreement. And um, the past economic sanctions pineapples and stuff like that. It's not been that big, but I mean, they could, it's a little delicate because China needs the chips from Taiwan, so there's certain things they can't touch, but I think uh, they can make things a lot harder for the economy, which would redound against the DPP administration. And, um, and also, I have heard that uh, another economic strategy, which is sort of the flip side, is to increase the convenience for Taiwanese entrepreneurs to prosper in the mainland, which is a long-term strategy of building up a pro-unification. You know, I, I don't know how effective that would be, but that would be the idea of pro-unification forces. And the thing I wanted to throw in is that as we puzzle as we talk about what, what can be done, and we sort of give you this picture that kind of nothing can be done, we're trapped in this very narrow space. Um, uh, the, the best we can do is not to, you know, not to change. <laughs> the Taiwanese voter is in that same constrained space even more than we are, as, as you know, sort of foreigners looking at what our policy can be, and I think, um, the sense of frustration of the voters in Taiwan that can you vote for Lai, can you vote for Ko, can you vote for Ho, you know, nobody has an answer. So, you know, we're looking for, the, the vo voters tend to look for somebody who has an answer. Uh, and, and, you know, it's going to break out of this trap, but there's, nobody has an answer to break out of the trap. So I think some of the frustration of the voters might be attributable to that um, sort of um, emotional sense of being trapped. I think that's a fair point. And if uh, you look at uh, Coolidge's position, I mean, two of the things that seem to resonate, it's always hard to unpack. People say a great number of things in a campaign. But one of the things he says is, oh, could we stop talking about China all the time? You know, can we please focus on some of these domestic issues, which polls say are top of mind for Taiwanese voters, I mean, economic issues, social policy, things like that. Uh, but the, the other uh, part of it is that he, kind of offered this um, you know, possibly empty bomb, which is, I'm a smart guy, I can figure out how to do this. The KMT and the DPD have tried it, they haven't figured it out. Um, uh, you know, they're beating up on one another, but I alone can fix it. And we had a bit of that vibe going, and I, I think, you know, it's got a certain a certain appeal, which, which uh, may account for his, uh, his 26%. Anything further on that? So um, we're about to throw it open for questions, but I have to ask what I'm sure will be one of the questions from the floor, which is, you know, when I was in, in Taiwan, people, the, the run-up to the election, people were saying, oh, who do you think is going to win? And I'm like, I don't know, you've got polls, you know, and you know Taiwanese politics better than I do. They said, oh, yeah, but 
you know, what about your election? And I said, well, actually, that's probably the more consequential election for Taiwan, because whether Lai wins or Ho wins or even Ko wins, you're not going to see a lot of room for, for deviation from, uh, from status quo policies. The uh, U.S. is a little less constrained, the luxury of being a superpower. So if, um, if we wake up uh, the morning of November, whatever it is, and Donald Trump has been re-elected president, uh, when he was elected the first time, I, the morning after the election, I boarded a Trans-Pacific flight to Shanghai for a trilateral U.S.-Taiwan-China Track 2 conference, the longest Trans-Pacific flight I've ever been on. I was the first person on the first panel and said, I'm here to seek political asylum, and I'm from the U.S. <laughs> and China, so this is not good. Uh, so you know where it was. I've laid my cards on the table. Well, what, what should we expect from a, a possible second Trump administration? And what I kept saying to people who would ask this in, in China and in, in Taiwan, of Taiwan was you can't simply project from Trump term one to Trump term two. It's not going to be uh, back to the future. So what what should we look for? What should we worry about? So I, I, I feel that uh, uh, that Trump could go either way. So one way is, and the, the, I think the most likely thing is because he's surrounded by uh, people who believe that China's cheating us in trade. And he has, we have all this reporting in the New York Times about what Trump's people around Trump are planning for the second term. And one of the things they're planning is to put a, a, a tariff, and I don't know, is it 10%? Or exactly. I think it was a 10% tariff on all imports, and there was looser talk, less well documented, of a 60% tariff on right, China. That's it. Uh, so put a tariff, and so, uh, so there's the trade thing, which would, which is not only China, as Jacques says, but which definitely would impact our relations with China. And in that sense, you know, it's some way make things worse for Taiwan. I guess there would be a tariff on Taiwanese imports as well. According to that, I don't know. They may carve out some exceptions, um, and. He's surrounded by people who are extremely anti-China. So I mean, following the anti-China logic would be what we've been talking on the panel about provoking uh, China somehow, saying you saying something about and doing something about Taiwan that would provoke China and maybe force Xi. So Bonnie said that um, some some of the people in Washington think that if we show uh, our resolution to Xi Jinping will back off. This is absolutely impossible. That won't happen. You know, so that's just going to create a crisis. The other Trump that could wake up. What day is today? It's too, too, okay. I feel good today. I'm, I'm tough. Xi, I understand Xi Jinping. The guy's tough. Let's get him on the way. Xi, all right. I don't give a shit about Taiwan. All right, you, you take it. Okay, we're friends. That could happen. I believe that could really happen. I honestly believe that could happen some Tuesday morning, not Wednesday. But if it's Tuesday, so he's very unpredictable in those two extreme directions. One thing we can definitely rule out is anything in the middle. So I'll say that when I worked in the Pentagon, I had the fortune as a civilian, not political, spent one year in the last Obama administration, two years in the first Trump administration, uh, working on Taiwan and China policy under Secretary Mattis. And I would say the first two years under Secretary Mattis, our policies towards China and Taiwan were very good. So, so there is... <laughs> So there, there is a, a bit of uncertainty of where, where policy could be with under a Trump administration. Um, we, we've recently seen President Trump um, respond to, uh, I think, a recorded segment of whether uh, he was asked whether the United States should defend Taiwan. And I think he said, I can't tell you now because that would it, that would that could be used against me in, in future decision making. And they, he made a comment about Taiwan's chips. So I, I think he's, he's purposely cl uh, keeping the cards very close to himself when it comes to Taiwan policy. But in terms of his track record and the track record of those within the administration, exactly like you said, it, they're all very much uh, China hawks. Um, there's very much strong support for Taiwan. Uh, if you recall, President-elect Trump was one of the few uh, US leaders who made a call uh, to President Tsai. And I would also venture that even if we do change some of our Taiwan policy. I think the Chinese, 
to be, to be frank, are more, um, a little bit more afraid of President Trump because of his unpredictability from their perspective. There's a, there's a little bit more of a fear that President Trump may use force in a way that President Biden may not. And whether you like that, like it or not, it creates some deterrence, I, I personally believe. So how, how he changes his policy on Taiwan will be one thing. Um, how his advisors advise him will be another. And then there's also, a, regardless of what he does on Taiwan, how China assesses they can respond to President Trump will be different than how they can respond to President Biden. I'd agree with all that. I think the feedback loop is one important source of instability wherever we may start. But the other thing to be said is that um, Trump has not been a great proponent of the solidity and unshakability of U.S. alliances. And Taiwan, of course, is not a formal treaty ally, but you know, Europe's skittish, Japan would be skittish, Korea would be skittish. It just creates a much more volatile world if the, the allies uh, become believers in the, uh, the um, uh, America unreliability thesis that has, has gained some traction in, in Taiwan as well. So we need to throw it open uh, to the audience. So um, I think there's a microphone floating around. So if you can just... So um, this is excellent, by the way. Thank you very much for these insights. So let me just follow this discussion with the obvious next question, which is between now and the election, at which we'll either know Biden or Trump probably, then given the unpredictability of Trump one way or the other and the military bent of many of his probable advisors, what does that tell you about likely coercion between now and then? Because if you were sitting in China's position, um, risk rises if Trump is president. I can take a first crack at that. Um, so when I talk to Chinese interlocutors about how they view the US election and how they view the Taiwan election, uh, the overwhelming answer I get is the US election is what matters to them. The Taiwan election matters, but the most important election for them this year is the US election. And they're not, the last thing they want to do is to take a significant response to Taiwan and then make our elections all about anti-China and help whoever is most anti-China win in the U.S. elections. So this is a um, whether you believe what they what their communi what, whether you believe what uh, what our Chinese interlocutors or our colleagues are communicating is one thing, but that seems to be the consistent message they've been sharing um, in, in discussion that I've had. So it does seem, at least on the Chinese side, there is a recognition that we're in a relatively sensitive period in the United States, and their actions uh, vis-a-vis Taiwan could have a tremendous effect on impacting a longer term uh, PRC interest beyond just Taiwan. So there's also a lot of discussion about what one of the parties to this triangle, typically the US or China, wants to have happen in elections elsewhere, right? So this Chinese theory that the US wanted Lai Qingdo to win and, and things like that. I think this is actually one where we were genuinely pretty neutral in, in terms of US preferences and interests. There were upsides and downsides to both the major candidates, but not always true in prior Taiwan elections. Um, the Chinese sort of policy intellectuals, at least, the people who are kind of plugged into the government, we'll talk about these things. Um, it's been sort of an interesting arc. Uh, they were fairly pro-Trump in 2016, although the reasons were diverse. They were partly, um, you know, he's a, he won't be like Hillary and press human rights. You know, for some of them, not a woman leader, which is you know, better in the sexist view of these things. Um, for some of it, he's, he's uh, you know, he's, um, uh, inept enough, he will hasten American decline. <laughs> there was also the view of, uh, of um, you know, he's he's um, he's a corrupt authoritarian. We know how to deal with these. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of uh, theses kicking around. By 2020, the view was, I am tired of waking up every morning not knowing what I'm going to have to face. And so it was just the sheer exhaustion of the Trump churn. Uh, so there was kind of a swing toward Biden. It was colored a little bit by the hope of a reset in U.S.-China relations, which did not happen. Uh, and so my sense is going into 24, there's this kind of frustrated resignation uh, in, in policy circles in China that, you know, if Biden reigns in office, it's going to be more of the same, and that's bad. On the other hand, if Trump comes in, it's much higher variance, but it's going to be more of a headache. And so uh, there's no, not really a great, a great solution. But I don't think there's an incentive for China to do anything radical in the run-up, partly for the reasons Bonnie says, that it could have uh, blowback effects. Um, Hard to, hard to know how it would play out, but you're at the very least going to wind up with some president who's going to come in uh, with a, a mandate to be really tough on China. 
Um, and I think it's also that, that uh, China kind of wants to wait a little bit to see what Lai does. At least the pattern in prior Taiwanese elections is, okay, Beijing digests the election results, does a few things in the run-up to the inauguration, but it really waits to see what's said on May 20th. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, so, I think an assumption um, that is really common in the discourse is that you, someone, whether it's the U.S. or Taiwanese voters, have the capability to provoke China or aggravate China um, in some way. And I think that, in my mind, that assumption rests on some level of trust in Xi Jinping to respond to whatever the United States is doing. And I just want to ask, like, how solid you think this, what, what the evidence is behind this assumption that if you, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick, then that will be less likely to provoke China into taking action on Taiwan um, in a more aggressive way, and, you know, you might be able to be more submissive to China and therefore protect Taiwan a little bit more rather than if you, you know, send Pelosi to fly over Taiwan and then that'll, that'll poke the bear. Um, because, of course, like China's policy since 1949 has been that Taiwan is inevitably going to be part of the PRC if it, and you know it is part of the PRC and it will be under the same jurisdiction so um, I guess what are the what is like in your view the strongest evidence that um, any US policy can uh, or they have an, have a substantial effect on Chinese um, attitude toward Taiwan also given that and a lot of people talk about oh well ever since Tsai one was elected, China's been much more aggressive toward Taiwan since the Ma Zhou period, but also, you know, China's military has grown every year, China's economy has grown every year. We don't have the counterfactual as if, would China be less aggressive if Mao was, or if the KMT was in power since 2016? Um, yeah, thank you. So, the, as I understand your question, it has sort of two sides to it. So, why do we think that uh, if we don't provoke him, he won't attack, right? And so then the, the argument there is partly that he, it's a, it's a very, very difficult, costly, risky military operation that no sane person just wants to do until they have a very strong assessment that they're gonna win. So, uh, so that's the basic reason for thinking that he uh, is uh, you know, not, not going to attack until there's quite a bit of a change in the likelihood of winning. And that has a lot of elements to it, including the corruption scandals in the Chinese military and so on. Um, uh, as well as their, um, I mean, as Jacques has sort of interpreted their declaratory policy, which is, um, we don't care who you elect because you're part of China. Um, and the patience that they have shown. So I think militarily they have to show patience and, and this ratcheting up policy is an alternative to launching an attack. And then the other side of your question is, why do we believe that if we provoke him, he will attack, despite what I just said? And there my logic is that they have uh, made these threats, for example, in the anti secession law and sort of laid down these and they constantly refer to red lines and so they are they've sort of backed themselves into a position where they have to respond to certain the, the definition of these red lines has some fuzziness to it you know so uh, obviously an out and out declaration of the Republic of Taiwan would be a clear red line but so many other red lines have passed, the two-state, you know, Liang Guolin, the two-state theory, and uh, as somebody just said, you know, the claim that Taiwan is an independent country called the ROC, and all, the, all those red lines have been crossed without China doing anything, but, but we do think that someplace there's a red line that Xi Jinping would have to publicly back down if he wasn't going to attack. And there's a long tradition of sort of historical scholarship in Chinese foreign policy studies, such as Alan Whiting's great book of the, when was it, the 1960s, 
that he did for Rand called China Crosses the Yalu, which sort of says when the Chinese say something very clearly that they would do if something happened, it's better to believe it because that's their, of course that was then and this is now and things change, but that, that, that their diplomatic um, practice is to uh, make good on their threats, which is something that is not always true of the United States. Uh, yeah. I, I just say that, that sort of one piece of this is that um, the current conventional wisdom, which is you know, probably right, um, is that there's no timetable uh, for moving against Taiwan, and that what would trigger a military action against Taiwan, something more than the gray zone tactics, which are sort of the preferred method, would be a sense that Taiwan is about to slip irrevocably away. And that's why the 60% you know, vote not for lies is a minor good sign for them. Um, and so there is, a, I don't want to overstate it because I think it's a very small effect, but there is an interactive effect that the more the U.S. Is, is being portrayed or being perceived as really pushing for Taiwan independence as a permanent basis and the strategic asset talk feeds into that, that does have at the margin the risk of pushing Xi in the position that only force will prevent permanent separation that's, that's a bad pathway to go down. But you know, the, the logic, on the other side, I'll, I'll have two hands, just like Andy does, and say, but you know, on the other hand, the other conventionalism, which I think is right, is that deterring China is becoming ever more difficult, and part of deterrence is to send strong signals that under certain circumstances you will act, and so you kind of got to do that. So you know, there are poles in both directions, which is why it's a tough question. Tough question. Does the average Taiwanese wake in the morning and say, thank God, they didn't attack overnight. Is it just background noise, um, or do they, have, have they been able not to think about it at all? There are a lot of uh, people who are much better described as average Taiwanese in the audience than you have up here on this stage. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't think it's what, I mean, it's, you know, clearly life goes on, right? I mean, there are other issues in it. The one, the one sort of semi-hard fact I can point to on that, aside from his conversations with lots of Taiwanese, is you look at the polling about what people cared about in the election, and cross rates was certainly up there, but it was you know in the top four or five issues. It didn't, it didn't outweigh uh, everything else. And I think one of the frustrations you hear from Taiwanese voters is it's all cross rates all the time, and we really want to talk about these other kinds of issues. And I think that's partly Taiwanese politics. That is. It's going to be really tough for anybody to solve the social and economic problems. It's a system where it's very hard to raise taxes, very hard to do redistribution, very hard to do big government programs, very hard to change Taiwan's international circumstances in a way that, that solve the problems. So what do you do? You disqualify the other party on the exit. You say if you elect, <laughs> somebody just says, <laughs> you say, so the KMT says if you elect the DPP, that's the path to war. The says if you elect the KMT, that's the path to authoritarianism and concession. And if you can disqualify the other party on this not top of mind existential issue, then you get, you get some, some political credit. But it, people really care about it. Next question. Um, so now the U.S. is facing two wars. One, uh, the Israel-Hamas war in the Middle East, and then the other, the Ukraine war in Europe. And some are worried that China could seize the window and invade Taiwan. So what's your take on this? Well, I'll just start by saying that we currently, if I, if I, if I recall correctly, we currently have three aircraft carriers in the Indo-Pacific. So yes, we may be um, supporting Ukraine. We may be uh, uh, supporting and, and watching very closely what's happening in the Middle East, as well as other activities in the, in the Red Sea and elsewhere, but I don't think we're, we're not focused at all on Indo-Pacific. I would say if you if you understand uh, this administration, Biden administration, we are laser focused on China, and we are also aware of the, the, the potential perception if we aren't uh, as active in the region that China could believe that it could um, potentially engage in more aggressive action. But let me also unpack a little bit about the second assumption that you made. I think all of us probably agree that China is not 
just looking for an opportunity to attack if the United States is preoccupied, right? As, as uh, Andy was mentioning earlier, there's a lot of calculations that China has to take into account when thinking about its policy towards Taiwan. It's not just U.S. preoccupation, not just U.S. military power, but it's also the extraordinary costs of potentially engaging in such an operation. Hi, thank you. Um, so in the event of a naval blockade or some type of economic embargo, which I think some would probably say is more likely than some sort of kinetic action that, that you described, Bonnie, um, how do you think the U.S. would respond to that? Because I think that's much more in the, in, in the gray zone of, of how to respond and how to garner global support uh, to, to prevent China's actions. Thank you. I can take the first cut then. Okay. So um, we're, we're doing significant research at CSI on this issue right now. Um, so we are defining um, a quarantine, which is a use of Chinese uh, non-military assets to impose a, to cut off maritime trade around Taiwan, as if from a blockade where China is using the PLA to lead that effort. And what, what, what I'll say is, uh, based off of our research, as well as discussions with both our US government colleagues, as well as Taiwan military colleagues, but also many close allies and partners, it will be more difficult for us for sorry, the United States international community to respond to a quarantine than a no kidding blockade because a blockade is a declaration of war and you have the PLA leading. So it's much easier to respond military to military. But if you have Chinese civilian assets potentially cir circling Taiwan, not even blocking off the entire Taiwan Strait, it's much more difficult for us to respond, but also to, for us to get some of our allies and partners to want to be joined in that effort. But the upside is, if they're only using civilian assets to try to encircle Taiwan, to be honest, they're less powerful than the PLA, so it's actually not as escalatory of an operation and may not even last as long, depending on how China wants to run it, than an actual uh, blockade involving the PLA. Hello, I'm sorry if this may be a little bit off the main topic, but could you comment on uh, to the Taiwanese voters? Do they look at all on uh, what's going on in Hong Kong over the past several years as kind of a model of maybe where they're headed? So the, the situation in Hong Kong was a very big issue in the last presidential election. Uh, so if you looked at when the 2016 campaign began, which by the way, we should all remember, included a challenge by Lai Ching the to Tsai Ing-wen for the presidential nomination. So Tsai is one very disciplined politician to take him on as her vice president after that kind of challenge, uh, and then to support him for the presidency. I mean, it's a, it's a remarkable statement of, of political um, you know, sort of rigor. But you know, to a significant degree, what happened in Hong Kong uh, assured Tsai's re-election in 2016, uh, because China has continued to insist that some form of the one country, two systems model, the thing implemented in Hong Kong, uh, applies or must apply to Taiwan, and over the, you know there have not been profound shifts in in the way China talks about a future Taiwan arrangement, but it has narrowed a bit. So if you look at the 2022 white paper, the thing that came out on the Taiwan question shortly after the Pelosi visit, uh, it doesn't change a whole lot of prior policy, but it's it, it insists on the one country two systems arrangement against the backdrop of what had happened in Hong Kong, which is clearly a much less accommodating arrangement than was promised in 1997, 1984, uh, when the agreement was signed. So, but by now, it, it's kind of faded into the background, except to the extent that there is essentially zero constituency for a Hong Kong-like one country, two systems model in Taiwan. That model has become more odious after 2016, and nobody talks about it anymore. I mean, no one in Taiwan who has any hope for a political future uh, can can do that. So it's not like it's, a, it's an issue on which uh, um, parties try to distinguish themselves from one another in Taiwan. It's just not a salient cleavage everybody is on. The, this is not for us side of it. Um, thank you so much for your time and for this evening. Uh, just a quick question, just going back to the domestic politics of Taiwan, um, something I was thinking about was the election of the, the uh, legislature UN and how this marks the first time since 2004 that no party won an outright majority. 
So I was just wondering what were your thoughts on the results of this election and how this will present perhaps a challenge for the upcoming president in regards to garnering support for the DT DPP and the, these relations between the three parties now that the legislature and that the DPP no longer has the majority. Thank you. I'll start and then I'm asked my two colleagues to weigh in. The, you know, it, it's indicative of the dissatisfaction of the Taiwan electorate to some degree with both the DPP as the long incumbent party and the KMT before it. But, you know, let's not forget that those still are by far the two biggest parties. And the TPP has made some inroads and it's been impressive for an upstart party. Um, so I don't think you can read a whole lot out of this except that there is a fair amount of dissatisfaction in Taiwan, but it's not a revolutionary change in, in party alignment. And it remains to be seen uh, how long the TPP is going to last. I mean, they had five seats in the last legislature. They have eight in this. That's a significant uptick. Obviously, the presidential campaign is something. But, you know, Taiwan has a, a, a history of, of third and fourth parties that tend to appear briefly and then disappear. Now, most of them are fringe parties, so they're deeper green than the DPP or deeper blue than the KMT. So, of course, they go away. This is kind of unusual in that it's a somewhat centrist party and, and you know, can tap into all that. Um, but I think going forward, the problems are really more practical ones. Uh, we'll know tomorrow uh, if a deal has been struck, and if so, with whom. Uh, and it's a very different world if the TPP group in Parliament throws in its lot with the DPP than if it throws in its lot with the KMT. I mean, that creates a very, you know, one's a divided government dynamic, the other is a kind of very weak unified government dynamic. And, and this is one of the peculiarities of the Taiwanese constitutional system is it's a semi-presidential, semi-parliamentary system. Um, so, you know, you can be president uh, without a majority in the legislature, rather like the US. And then you have this additional weird wrinkle that the president picks the premier essentially without regard for what the legislature thinks, but there are costs to picking a premier that the legislature doesn't like. So I think the real problem is getting together um, majorities for voting for the many students Taiwan has to deal with. Of concern to the US is arms procurement and special defense budgets, but every social and economic policy issue, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough for Lai to accomplish a lot um, because there are going to be incentives uh, to defect and there are obviously a range of, of views. And one thing we didn't get into, but if you look at the eight TPP legislatures, legislators, they do not occupy a neat little middle part of the political spectrum. Their background has them really spread from pretty, pretty blue. Um, thank you. If I could add um, really quickly to that, uh, to the answer, but even on defense issues, we've seen under uh, President Tsai, they pass special defense budgets that require legislative buy-in. So if um, if uh, President Lai is facing a, um, uh, a legislature that has a majority that is opposed to him, uh, even on defense issue, uh, on defense budget and major items, that if he wants to repeat what President Tsai has done, it might be more difficult. I think we may have time for one more. Oh, yes, so there was the mention that the U.S. need to do more to defend Taiwan because of the increasing power gap. So what would be a good balance here? Do you have more specific recommendations? Thank you. Sure, so, so I think we're already doing a lot right now um, with Taiwan. Um, I don't really have any um, recommendations beyond the tr current trajectory that we're on. But um, this is one issue where um, it's important that we're continuing, for example, to provide arms, major arms to Taiwan, that we're continuing, where possible, to train Taiwan, and the United States continues to maintain our presence around Taiwan, including the most recent Taiwan Street Transit. But to, but to Andy's point, um, it's important that we do all these things, and China tracks all of these activities. They are well aware of how many U.S. forces are on Taiwan, but I think if there's one area that we don't necessarily need to broadcast as much uh, in China tracks, that's definitely on the military side. And yeah, but I do believe um, that we should try to push the envelope as much as possible on this front, but perhaps talk a little bit less <laughs> on this front. I say two things. One is uh, it is a long, slow process uh, to articulate fully and implement asymmetrical defense, and that's been a real U.S. talking point toward Taiwan. Taiwan has moved in that direction, but you know, military industrial complexes and the national defense establishments are what they are, and it's very hard to convince people they don't need the super high-end fancy toys. Um, and so that's, that's a long slog that I think has been with us for a while. The other thing is for the U.S., allies are the great force multiplier. Uh, China doesn't have an alliance structure, the U.S. does. 
uh, and Japan has moved ever closer to uh, alignment with the U.S. position on Taiwan. Korea is a little tougher. Uh, the Philippines is now back uh, you know, more firmly on the U.S. side. And so I think you know, that's what gives the U.S. Uh, leverage and greater power than its own resources. Now, you know, that's all to the good, uh, and I think one of the risks of Trump is, is destabilizing that. But you've got to realize it does feed into the Chinese narrative of encirclement. You know, we, could, we could spend all day talking about implications of Ukraine for Taiwan. I'm kind of glad we didn't get into that because it always gives me a headache, uh, to especially if you try to do it in short form. But I think it's a really interesting question. And one of the, um, the uh, issues that there is, is that one of the pieces of Putin's narrative that China really picked up was we're being encircled. You know, NATO made me do it, is the Putin view. And then so you, China tries to grab onto this. If we do something, it's because of this, this uh, encirclement uh, of China from Japan to Taiwan to Korea to Vietnam to India. Any last thoughts? I agree. Uh, well, I mean, when Andy Nathan agrees with me, I know enough to declare a victory and leave the field. So thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank uh, Bonnie and Andy for coming and doing it.